Now celebrating our 22nd year of service to the worldwide amateur radio community, we are This Week in Amateur Radio, North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service of the air. Here are the stories for release around the earth as we come to air with edition number 1167 of This Week in Amateur Radio. The very first X-Class Solar Flare of Solar Cycle 25 blacks out the HF bands on July 3rd. Amateur radio volunteers all along the eastern seaboard activated for Hurricane Elsa. The June Volunteer Monitoring Program report is out. We will give you a quick overview. The Square Kilometer Array Observatory. All of their antennas will span two continents. How's that for an antenna system? We will tell you all about it. Registration is open for the upcoming International Lighthouse and Lightship Weekend special event. The FCC has released a notice of a filing extension for the space launch proceeding. And a special event station revolving around the planet Pluto is coming up. We will have that and a lot more, including reports from Steve Richards, G4, Hotel Papa Echo, covering Europe and the UK. All of that is coming up in this week's edition of This Week in amateur radio. These headline stories will come to you in a moment along with this week's special features. We'll visit with Bruce Page, KK5DO, and get an update from AMSAT and what's new with all of those amateur satellites in orbit. Our technology reporter, Leo Laporte, W6TWT, has a big report this week. He will tell you about a new ransomware spreading via a Kaseya supply chain attack. Leo will also tell us about the oldest person about to go into space with Jeff Bezos. He'll tell us about problems that IBM is having mitigating its internal email system. And he will tell us about a new law that has been passed in Norway that stipulates you must label any photo you retouch or filter and post on the internet. Australia's own Anno Benshoff, VK6FLAB, will answer the question, what mode is that? Our own amateur radio historian, Bill Continelli, W2XOI, returns with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives. This week, Bill continues his series on amateur radio's fallen flags. This week, he will take a look at the history of helicrafters. And our tower climbing and antenna master, Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, will conclude his six-part series this week on writing a professional public service announcement to publicize your next club meeting or Hamfest on local broadcast radio. And coming up a little later in our newscast, we'll have an interview conducted by Hap Holly, KC9RP, with Alex Muzaika, KQ2H. He's the man behind the KQ2H 10 meter FM repeater in the Catskill Mountains of New York on 69.620 megahertz. That's all straight ahead as North America's premier amateur radio and technology news magazine and bulletin service this Week in Amateur Radio takes to the air right now. Reporting from our headquarters studio here in sunny Albany, New York, and this is the second sunny day in the month of July, I'm George, W2XBS. And reporting from our news bureau in the broadcast capital of the world, this is N2WWW in Schenectady, New York. And reporting from the newsroom in Half Moon, New York, I'm Terry Saunders, N1KIN. And reporting from our news bureau just outside Albany, New York, from the Geek Cave Studios, I'm Rich Lawrence, KB2MOB. And from Studio One of our Central Florida News Bureau, where it's been nothing but rain all week, I'm Fred, November Fox 2 Fox. And reporting from a rain soaked Troy, New York News Bureau, I'm Eric Sattel, KD2RJX. And reporting from the western Catskill Mountains in upstate New York, where it's been one thunderstorm after another, after another, after another for seven days in a row now, and more as expected for the next five days. I'm Don Hewlett, K2AT, Soggy J. And now with our lead story, here is Pat Yuba, and 2 www Leading off our news this week, a lot of radio amateurs may have been wondering, where did the bands go? As the first X-Class solar flare in four years blacked out HF propagation for a time on July 3rd. 
Here with more details on the latest activity from our star, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this special report from League Headquarters in Newington. Space weather this week has been a total game changer. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. That enthusiastic young lady is Tabitha Skull, WX6SWW, the space weather woman, giving her version of recent events on the sun. Wham! Here's an X 1.5 flare. Oh my goodness, it's the first X-class flare of Solar Cycle 25, but it doesn't wait long and wham! There's another M-class flare goes off. Oh my goodness, this thing is just rapid firing. It's like pop, 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 pop. Indeed, for a brief time on July 3rd, a lot of radio amateurs were wondering, where did the bands go? As the first X-class solar flare in four years blacked out HF propagation for a time. As Frank Donovan, W3LPL, explains less enthusiastically, that brief HF blackout occurred when Solar Active Region 2838 produced an X1.5 major solar flare that reached peak intensity at 1429 UTC. It was the first X-class solar flare of Solar Cycle 25 and the first since 2017. Donovan says HF blackouts are caused when X-ray and extreme ultraviolet radiation from X-class solar flares strongly ionizes the absorbing D region in the Earth's sun-facing dense lower atmosphere. In this instance, it caused what NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center called an R3 level or strong radio blackout on a scale of R1 to R5. An R3 incident can cause a wide area blackout of HF communication and loss of radio contact for about an hour on the sunlit side of Earth. Donovan said X-class major flares are necessary consequences of steadily increasing solar cycle 25 activity. X-class major flares are measured on an open-ended scale. The strongest one ever recorded was an X-28 flare in 2003, hundreds of times more powerful than the one on July 3rd. Oh my goodness. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. 95% of all X-class solar flares occur when the solar flux index is 90 or greater. The remaining 5% can occur any time during the solar cycle, he points out. X-1-class major solar flares typically degrade HF propagation for only an hour or two at mid and high latitudes, only on Earth's sunlit side. X-10 class and stronger solar flares typically have effects that last for most of a day and affect the entire sunlit side of the Earth. Fortunately, X-10 class solar flares occur only about once every 20 years or more. Much more severe and long-lasting HF propagation degradations are often caused by the coronal mass ejections, often associated with but not caused by major solar flares, Donovan explained. HF propagation degradation caused by coronal mass ejections typically begins about two days after the effects of the associated solar flare. The duration of the delay depending on interactions between the coronal mass ejection and the solar wind. The coronal mass ejections associated with the July 3rd X1.5 solar flare is likely to have little to no effect on HF propagation going forward because the active region was very close to the western edge of the visible solar disk when the CME erupted. Region 2838 rotated off the visible disk on Sunday, July 4th. Solar flares have no significant effect on VHF ionospheric propagation, but can degrade satellite communications passing through the ionosphere. More frequent, less powerful M-class medium solar flares produce short-duration degradation at high latitudes. Very frequent, much weaker A, B, and C-class solar flares do not degrade HF propagation. The weather event known as ELSA, a tropical storm that also achieved Category 1 hurricane status, prompted actions by the ARRL, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service, and the Hurricane WatchNet as the storm set its sights on Florida this week. For more details on Amateur Radio's response to this latest storm to track up the coast, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, who files this report from ARRL headquarters.
The storm made landfall along the Gulf Coast of northern Florida on July 7th before weakening significantly as Tropical Storm Elsa moved up the East Coast, the eastern New York and New York Long Island sections received a request from the American Red Cross Greater New York Region to have Aries groups put on alert from July 9th through July 15th. In the northern Florida section, nets were activated and the section saw six emergency operations centers and many shelters open. The northern Florida section stood down from a level three monitoring activation on July 7th. ARRL Emergency Management Director Paul Gilbert, KE5ZW, assured members that ARRL headquarters and the ARRL Emergency Management Department were monitoring the storm's progress and would be ready to assist if needed. The hurricane watch net initially activated for ELSA on July 2nd after it became a Category 1 hurricane. The HWN reactivated for several hours on July 6th, standing down after about eight hours. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. Please stay aware of developing conditions, Eastern New York Section Communications Manager Dave Gallaty, KM2O, urged. I ask that groups in the Eastern New York Southern District prepare for possible deployment in support of ARC as of Friday, July 9th. Groups in the Central and Northern Districts should also keep touch with weather developments and stand by for possible mid- to long-term support of Southern District groups. On July 6th, Northern Florida Section Emergency Coordinator Carl Martin, K4HBN, activated the Aries net on 3.950 MHz. Because the storm was extremely close to Barbados, St. Lucia, and St. Vincent, we went into operation to collect and forward weather data to the National Hurricane Center in Miami, Net Manager Bobby Graves, KB5HAV, said. ELSA has produced some wind damage, but the major hazard from the storm so far appears to be heavy rain, flooding, and storm surge. Some suspected tornadoes have been reported. ELSA is expected to move across the southeastern and mid-Atlantic United States. The June 2021 activity report of the Volunteer Monitoring Program has been released. The Volunteer Monitor Program is a joint initiative between ARRL and the FCC to enhance compliance in the amateur radio service. The FCC was requested to review a vanity call sign application filed by a Georgia licensee because of an apparently false answer to the question regarding a felony conviction. A licensee in Massachusetts received an advisory notice concerning obscenity and harassment on 160 meters. The FCC will hold for review any renewal application filed by this licensee. A general class licensee in San Antonio, Texas, received an advisory notice for operation in the amateur extra class portion of the 20 meter band. Licensees in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, and Virginia received advisory notices concerning failure to identify and other possible violations as part of a general audit of complaints about licensee conduct on 1.938, 3.860, 3.895, and 3.936 of the 2020. In May, volunteer monitors logged 1,514 hours on HF frequencies and 2,072 hours on VHF frequencies and above. The Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator had one meeting with the FCC and two cases were referred to the Commission for further action. One case involves a taxi company in Alaska operating on two meters. We thank the Volunteer Monitor Program Administrator, Riley Hollingsworth, K4ZDH, for this report. Californian online news site The Signal from Santa Clarita Valley in the USA recently published an article entitled What is Ham Radio? Bearing in mind that this is aimed at non-technical people who've never heard of amateur radio, it's an interesting perspective on how the hobby is viewed by the layman. In the article, Ham Radio is described as a service that operates across many frequency ranges and you can think of it as a walkie-talkie for the airwaves. The article says that there are over 784,000 licensed hams in the US. Each ham has a call sign and can communicate across hundreds of miles without cell phones or the internet. It's like having a free, long-distance service that connects you to people around the world. A license is required to own and operate ham radio equipment and the cost of the license is $15 and it's good for 10 years. Once you have your license, thousands of groups and repeater stations across the US can join in, making communication easy. The website goes on to give an overview of what ham radio is all about, how to get started and how someone interested can build up a knowledge base at their own pace. 
The article gives the American regulators, that's the FCC's, definition of the amateur radio service. It's formally described as the use of radio frequencies for personal recreation, self-training, intercommunication and emergency communication. Amateur radio operators provide essential communication services in times of local, national and international emergencies and disasters. Amateur radio operators also participate in public service events, such as the annual Field Day and National Simulated Emergency Test Exercises. And they helpfully add that the word amateur comes from the Latin word amtor, which means lover. Amateur radio is an old hobby, with traditions stretching back to the early 20th century. It was a fad for a while during that time, but was mostly limited to landing ships and similar environments. After World War I and II, many nations opened up amateur radio licenses to their citizens. The United States granted the first ham radio license to Marconi wireless radio operator George A. Hemming on November 2, 1905. The Signal article concludes by saying that ham radio is a hobby that keeps people connected through a common interest in radio communications. There are dozens of different types of communication modes to enjoy and learn. Each mode has its own unique dynamic and challenges, but at the end of the day you'll have a better understanding of how radio waves work and you'll have better skills to start solving problems in your day-to-day -day life. It's not only fun, but it's a great way to learn about electronics and radio communications. Well, if you'd like to read the full Santa Clarita Valley Signal article, go to signalscv.com. With a population just north of 71,000, the Caribbean island of Dominica, J7, boasts a modest but active ham radio population. Here with more on how this young Caribbean nation is formalizing amateur radio standards, we go to Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters in Newington. Given Dominica's vulnerability to hurricanes, the ham radio emphasis often focuses on emergency communication support. In 2017, after Hurricane Maria hit the tiny island, ham radio filled a huge telecommunications gap. Now the country's telecommunications regulator, NTRC, is asking HAMS to help formulate new amateur radio guidelines and standards. Dominica's National Telecommunication Regulatory Commission said that a primary source for the proposal document was FCC Part 97 rules. Other resources included the ARRL FCC rulebook, the ARRL Operating Manual for Radio Amateurs and the ARRL Handbook for Radio Communications. The regulator also looked at Canada's and Australia's amateur radio rules. The proposals would provide for three license classes, novice, general, and advanced, as well as licensing procedures for each class. I'm Mert Lindquist, WW1ME. There's limited guidance for those who seek to utilize the telecommunications media for their own personal use, enjoyment, and fulfillment as a hobby. As in the case of amateur radio, the NTRC said in the consultation document, generally amateur radio is self-regulating, and so the involvement of the telecommunications regulator is minimized. Through the amateur radio clubs generally do their best to provide some level of guidance and support to existing and prospective operators, there is great need for a formal and comprehensive set of guidelines and standards for the operation of amateur radio services in Dominica. The NTRC field held a public meeting via Zoom in mid-June to highlight and clarify important issues regarding the consultation. NRTC personnel later met with amateur radio club representatives at NRTC's office. Under the Telecommunications Act No. 8 of 2000 and its associated regulations, the NRTC oversees compliance with all telecommunications rules in Dominica, including amateur radio. The NRTC also manages amateur radio spectrum. Following the initial comment period, the NRTC will review the comments and subsequently submit the revised draft amateur radio guidelines and standards, a document for comments on the initial comments received. The NRTC will also review those comments and finalize the policy document, taking all views into consideration to adopt and publish the Amateur Radio Guidelines and Standards document. The Square Kilometer Array Observatory has been 30 years in the planning stage, and now work has commenced to build it as the world's largest radio telescope, comprising a network of dishes and antennas on two continents. 
two different parts of the telescope, the SKA low array and the SKA mid array, are under construction in Australia and South Africa, respectively. The South African site will have 200 large dish receivers, and Western Australia would be home to more than 131,000 small antennas spread throughout the region north of Perth. When completed, the telescope's collecting area will be one square kilometer with the ability to receive signals in the range between 70 megahertz to at least 25 gigahertz. Chiara Ferrari, who's director of a French organization involved in the project, called the radio telescope a game changer in many different fields. She said it will be uniquely positioned to answer some outstanding questions about the evolution of galaxies and offer us a unique opportunity to start studying the raw material behind the formation and evolution of bright sources from the cosmic dawn to current years. The announcement of its progress was made recently at the annual meeting of the European Astronomical Society. Scientists claim it will study the universe at depth never before achieved by any radio telescope. Scientists have followed up with this announcement by acknowledging that they will call an extremely concerning threat of radio frequency interference from many new satellite constellations, such as Starlink, OneWeb, and China's proposed Chinese Guang constellation. Philip Diamond, the observatory's director general, said that discussions were in progress with satellite operators for mitigation measures. Radio amateurs in the UK are getting quite exercised about the new Ofcom condition, which is about to be added to every transmitting license where the output power is greater than 10 watts. In the latest releases, the Radio Society of Great Britain has produced an online webinar which helps to explain further what the new condition is all about, and most importantly, how to comply with it. Now, some people are getting quite worked up on this subject, but from my perspective, the RSGB has made it relatively simple to produce calculations which can be kept alongside your license in the unlikely case that Ofcom pay you a visit. The Radio Society of Great Britain has made available the webinar given on Monday, July the 5th by EMC Chair John Rogers, M0 Juliet Alpha Victor, titled Assess Your Station Against ICN IRP EMF Levels. It's one of the Tonight at 8 webinar series. The RSGB said that Ofcom is implementing changes to all transmitting licenses to require licensees to comply with ICN IRP general public limits on EMF exposure. This will include previously license exempt users who transmit at powers of more than 10 watts EIRP. In the video, John introduces the work of the RSGB and the ARRL experts in assessment of exposure to electromagnetic fields. The RSGB responded to the Ofcom consultation on behalf of UK amateurs and is now preparing guidance on compliance with the new requirements. The talk outlines these requirements and introduces four ways to conduct and record the results of the assessment, include calculating required separation, use of known compliance station configurations and potential mitigating actions. You can watch this presentation on the RSGB YouTube channel. Just type in RSGB videos or RSGB tonight at 8. For more information, help and guidance on this subject, see the RSGB website www.rsgb.org forward slash EMF. Congratulations to three hams who have received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the Amateur Radio Lighthouse Society. Jim Buffington, K5JIM, Jim Elliott, KA3UNQ, and Dan Hatcher, KD3CQ. Jim Buffington has had a long career in professional broadcasting and has served the Lighthouse Society as Vice President and Chairman. He has activated lighthouses along the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast Eastern Seaboard and the Gulf Coast. He activated his first lighthouse in Biloxi in 2001. Jim Elliott has activated more than 200 East Coast lighthouses and has chased and contacted more than 1,450 others. He received the Society's first Activator of the Year Award in 2009, and he also developed a weekly chat room on the Society website. Dan has activated 178 lighthouses in 15 states, with 72 of them being first-time activations. He has also chased and confirmed almost 1,800 lighthouses in the U.S., Canada, and DX locations. Dan belongs to the Society's Advisory Council. The Society was founded in 2000 by Jim Wiedner, K2JXW. Set for August 21st and 22nd, the 24th Annual International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend will be back, despite the disruption of the global COVID-19 pandemic. 
Here with more on this special event is Rick Lindquist, WW1ME, reporting from League Headquarters. The 24th Annual International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend will be back August 21st, 22nd weekend following the disruption of the global COVID-19 pandemic last year. Each year, typically on the third weekend of August, participants set up portable stations at or near lighthouses and lightships around the world. Last year, prospects for the event were looking dim, but Regular supporters wanted the event to be a beacon of hope, the event sponsor said. More than 360 registrations from 43 countries backed up that belief. As of July 8th, this year's registration tally had already topped 200 with 25 participants signed up to activate lighthouses or lightships in the U.S. The ILLW typically attracts entries for some 500 lighthouses in more than 40 countries. The event has few rules and is not a typical contest type event. Each station's operators decide how they want to operate their station with respect to modes and bands. There are no power restrictions or entry classes and no scores. The sponsors say they want participating operators to enjoy themselves and have fun while making contact with as many amateur radio stations as possible. I'm Rick Lindquist, WW1ME. We wish operators to enjoy themselves and have fun while making contact with as many amateur radio stations as possible, International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend said in the event announcement. We request that stations take time to work other lighthouses or lightships as well as the slow operators or newly licensed or QRP stations. Participants contact the relevant authorities to obtain permission to operate. It is within the guidelines of the event to move operations from a lighthouse to a museum for historic reasons. In any case, the lighthouse should be visible to and visited by the public wherever possible. Visit the International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend website for more detailed information. A filing extension has been granted in the FCC's space launch proceeding. The FCC Office of Engineering and Technology has granted a 30-day extension for filing comments and reply comments on the further notice of proposed rulemaking in the non-federal space launch, federal earth stations, and federal space station proceedings in ET Docket 13-115. Comments will now be due by August 11th, and reply comments will be due by September 9th. As announced in June, the FCC is soliciting a second round of comments on whether to authorize commercial space entities to obtain licenses for frequencies used exclusively during space launch activities. The proposals include part of the 70 centimeter 420 to 430 MHz and part of the 5 centimeter 5650 to 5925 MHz bands. The Norwegian Radio Relay League, the NRRL, has recently received two substantial grants that will further its education and emergency preparedness programs. NRRL was given nearly $81,000 from the Research Council of Norway for the development of teaching material for amateur radio. According to NRRL, the grant will fund measures that strengthen children's and young people's digital competence through leisure activities. NRRL will develop online learning material for amateur radio and other activities over the course of the two-year project. Voluntary efforts from NRRL members will also be an important input factor in the project. We hope that many will take an active part in this work, which will be an importance of the future of amateur radio in Norway. NRRL has also received a grant of nearly $94,000 from the Gendigi Foundation for further support of its emergency preparedness and response initiative. The funds will specifically enable NRRL to develop and produce new tracking units that NRRL will use in its rescue service to locate volunteer teams on a map and in real time. In addition, the funds will support much needed equipment and joint exercises and skills development. Volunteer rescue crews have been a critical part of the Norwegian Rescue Service for more than 50 years. In close cooperation with the police and the main rescue center, they have over the years searched for and found thousands of missing individuals and saved hundreds of lives. These are tasks that the public sector itself does not have the capacity to perform, and volunteers are largely covered in the costs themselves. And now with the latest technology news and commentary from Petaluma, California. This Week in Amateur Radio is proud to present Leo Laporte. You got Leo right now. Your personal tech guy. 
Let's see. What's going on? More ransomware? Yes. Uh, there's a new ransomware out there. Kaseya is called. It's, actually, I don't know if it's new. It's just a new name to me. I think actually it's, a, it's another name for a different ransomware that's been around for a while. However, they found a new way of, uh, of getting it into your system. The Kaseya ransomware is, uh, is uh, being uh, spread via yeah, what they call a supply chain attack. So the Kaseya Security Institute, this is the Revil ransomware gang, R Evil or Revil. I don't know. R Evil? I guess R Evil. We are evil. Kaseya is a remote management platform used by a lot of MSPs, managed service providers. In other words, contract IT professionals. Somebody's coming in and managing your IT or your uh, servers or that kind of thing. They use Kaseya for remote management. And uh, Kaseya has been hacked, so it's estimated that maybe as many as, uh, oh, I don't know, thousands of MSPs have now become your worst nightmare. Our evil disables your local antivirus solution, if you have one, then deploys a fake Windows Defender app that runs the actual ransomware binary that encrypts the victim's files. So the first big victim this weekend... Sweden's largest supermarket chain has shut down nearly 800 stores across the country. Yes, its contractor, its managed service provider, got it through Kaseya, and he gave it to them. We'll see what happens. This is just the beginning, I think. The grocery store had to shut down because their cash registers uh, and self-serve stations went down, so nobody could uh, take payments. So the stores are closed today. They're hoping it'll reopen maybe tomorrow. If uh, if you were a Kaseya customer, take your system offline. <laughs> okay, got it. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the warning. These supply chain attacks are, attacks are hard to uh, hard to handle. So the supply chain that phrase means that you are getting attacked by something that you are using, which is in itself in its in its turn been hacked. And that's what solar winds, the big solar winds hack that uh, affected a lot of United States uh, cabinet departments, cabinet level departments, the military and so forth. Solar winds was a security provider, supply chain security provider that got hacked. And then that hack got passed along. Now, the same thing with Kaseya. I thought I'd let you know. Uh, the oldest person in space, Wally Funk. She was uh, the United States first female federa federal aviation administration inspector or formal name is Mary Wallace Funk. They would all call her Wally. She's uh, in July 20th. She's going to go up at the age of 82, older by five years than John Glenn, who was the oldest person in space, along with Jeff Bezos, the departing CEO of Amazon tomorrow, I think, or Monday is his last day. And his brother, Mark Bezos, and another auction winner, Wally Funk, in a video on Instagram, Jeff Bezos asked Funk what she will say when they return to Earth after spending four minutes in zero gravity. It's not a, they're not going orbit, orbital. They're doing what uh, Alan Shepard did. They're going up and down. But after four minutes in zero gravity, she says, I will say, honey, that's the best thing that ever happened to me. And then she gave Bezos a hug. She was uh, a member of the Mercury 13, a team of 13 American women. You may remember this, seeing this in history or... Uh, in the fictionalized Apple Plus TV program, she was a member of the Mercury 13, a 13 American woman who got astronaut training in the early 60s, but could not become astronauts because NASA said you have to be a military fighter pilot and only men are military fighter pilots. So it's kind of cool that she's finally, all this time, 60 years later, she's finally going to get to go in space. One of the Mercury 13. By the way, Bezos, who announced, yeah, we're, I'm going to go into space, the first billionaire in space, That's there's a record, too. He's going to do it on July 20th. So who who uh, said, oh, <laughs> hold my beer? Richard Branson, the uh, billionaire owner of the Virgin uh, Mega Group. He, uh, he owns Virgin Galactic. He's going up. He said, all right, in that case, I'm going up nine days earlier, July 11th. Same kind of thing. Up and down, just up and down. If you think uh, your company's IT is a mess, don't worry, it's kind of common. If your IT at home is a mess, it's kind of common. IBM, you'd think they'd know IT, right? IBM, the IBM, 
for a year and a half has been planning to migrate their email and it's just gone off the rails. It's been a disaster. According to the register, IBM's planned company-wide email migration has gone off the rails, leaving many employees unable to use email or schedule calendar events. And this has been going on for several days. One employee wrote to the register, I feel bad for bringing this to the press, but I'm afraid I'm the only one of many thousands. I'm a big, big blue or utterly disgruntled. If we can't even handle our own cloud migration program, why would any customer trust us? Oh, yeah, that's right. IBM's primary business is helping people with their technology. IBM Social Media, one IBMer wrote, Every IBMer has descended into a dark, chaotic pit of not being able to access email and calendars for the past three days. Wondering where we are. You know, if, if lack of email is putting you in a dark, chaotic pit, maybe you ought to get a life, you know? Hey, go home, enjoy the weekend. <laughs> Take a walk. Breathe the fresh air. IBM actually makes an email program that I used to use called, remember Lotus Notes? They call it IBM Notes now. They're moving away from that, ironically. Let's, uh, let's congratulate Norway. There's a new law. I think this is not a bad idea, although it would never fly in the U.S. A new law in Norway saying if you're an influencer on Instagram or any other social network, and you retouch your photos to look better, you've got to put a notice on there. you got to label retouched photos in a bid to fight unrealistic beauty standards. Well, this has only been going on in magazines for 50 years. You think that cover page on Vanity Fair or Vogue is unretouched? Well, anyway, a landslide vote on June 2nd, 72 to 15, the Norwegian regulators, legislators, pass this uh, law. The king of Norway decides when it goes into effect. Yeah, we have a king. The king of Norway. Advertisements where a body's shape, size, or skin has been retouched, even through a filter, even through a filter, will need a standardized label designed by the Norwegian Ministry of Children and Family Affairs. Examples of manipulations requiring labeling include enlarged lips, narrowed waist, exaggerated muscles. They call it, in uh, in Norway, they call it kopspress, or body pressure, a.k.a. beauty standards. You know what? Chill, man. No one looks like that. You don't have to look like that, but it does, Im it does, it does impact people, so I understand. I get it. Every time I see Kim Kardashian, I say, why isn't my butt that big? No, I don't. No, I honestly don't. Anyway, I'm glad you were here, and I'm here, and I'll be here next week, and I hope you'll come by and bring your friends, too, as we talk high-tech. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Are you ready for another trip into amateur radio history? I'm Bill Continelli, W2XOY, and I'll be back in a moment with another edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here on This Week in Amateur Radio. And now with this week's edition of the Ancient Amateur Archives, here's Bill Continelli, W2XOY. In 1932, at the height of the Great Depression, Bill Halligan, W9AC, age 33, formed a new company. He called his new business the Halicrafters. The name was chosen as a composite of the two words Halligan and Handcrafted. Bill adopted the creed Handcraft makes perfect, and it was used in the first logo of the new enterprise in late 1932. A few radio sets were built, the S1 through the S3, at an old manufacturing plant at 417 North State Street in Chicago. Immediately, the young Halicrafters company was beset with problems. Most of the hams these new radios were designed for hadn't yet recovered from the Great Depression and did not have the money to buy the radios. As of this wasn't enough, RCA came down hard on Halicrafters for patent infringements, insisting that no more radios could be built until they granted Halicrafters a license, which they had no intention of doing. Bill didn't give up. Procuring as many orders for his radios as possible, he contracted with a licensed manufacturer to build them in small production runs of 50 or 100 sets. He had to use these orders themselves for collateral, an arrangement that at best was very limiting. What Halicrafters needed was a license to build under the RCA patents. 
1933, Silver Marshall Incorporated went into bankruptcy, and Bill saw an opportunity to get his coveted license. A deal was engineered. Bill and Hallicrafters took over Silver Marshall Incorporated, renaming it the Silver Marshall Manufacturing Company and operating it from the State Street address. This relationship was also plagued with financial problems and ended in late 1934. Bill was released from his obligations to Silver Marshall with the help of the Echophone Radio Company. Echophone was also in financial trouble. For all practical purposes, it was out of business. But they had a 50,000 square foot plant and a good RCA license. Bill struck a deal with the owner of Echophone and the two companies merged with Hallicrafters being the dominant partner. During the first few months, the company did contract work for other radio manufacturers and large mail order houses in order to build its cash reserves. In late 1935, they started producing their own line of communication receivers, which we are all familiar with. The SX-9 Super Skywriter was the first model to be produced in significant quantities. Hallicrafters' policy was to build a quality product with all the state-of-the-art advances and features at a price that was affordable. With this policy and good management, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. By 1938, Hallicrafters was the most popular manufacturer of communications receivers in the U.S and was doing business in 89 other countries. Bill decided on another policy, that as new features and technical advances were made, Hallicrafters would bring out new models rather than just upgrade the same basic model. This explains the proliferation of different models, which in a three-year period from 1936 through 1938 had reached 23. Until 1938, the production was limited to receivers and associated accessories. Now it was time to produce transmitters. The onslaught of World War II took the U.S. by surprise. There was a shortage of military radio equipment and tremendous government demand for electronic equipment of all types. Many of the existing Hallicrafters products and designs were pressed into military service. The company geared up for wartime production and was responsible for many new designs and innovations. Probably the best known of these were the HT4, the BC610, and the SCR299. Production of ham radio gear and related items was all but suspended until 1945. By August of 1945, the war was over and so were wartime production and most government contracts. It was time again to produce ham radio equipment. A new line of consumer electronics was needed to satisfy a public hungry for products they had gone without for over five years. The old plant had served Hallicrafters well during the war years, but the company needed a modern image for their facility and product line in the post-war period. A new plant was designed and built at 4401 West 5th Avenue in Chicago. This would be the company's home for the next 20 years. The products were given a modern look with the help of Raymond Lowy, a well-known industrial designer of the time. One of the first post-war sets produced in the new facility was the SX-38. The logo was again changed, this time to the familiar Circle H. Production also began on the new line of consumer electronics, including radio phonograph units of all shapes and sizes, AM-FM receivers, clock radios in brightly colored Bakelite cases, and television receivers, the first of which was the T-54. Many of the consumer products bore the name Echophone, which had all been but forgotten by this time. Competition was stiff in the consumer electronics field, and this Hallicrafters line never really took hold, although it stayed in production until the late 1950s. Even so, the company was doing better than ever, employing 2,500 people by 1952. The 1950s were very successful for the company. The United States' focus during the 50s was civil defense, so many Hallicrafters products from this period bore the names like Civic Patrol and Defender. Some of the ham radio products became classics, 
like the HT32 and the SX101. Much of this equipment is still in use today and is sought after by nostalgia buffs and collectors. By 1958, Bill Sr. wanted to retire and the company was sold. Little is known about this transaction, but apparently it failed and the Halligans returned to resume control of the corporation a short time later. In 1963, Hallicrafters purchased Radio Industries Incorporated of Kansas City, running it as a subsidiary. Radio Industries produced many of the ham radio accessories and some major equipment like the HT-45. Also during this period, Hallicrafters was the corporate sponsor of REACT, which was formed in 1962. The Halligans continued operations until about 1966, when the company was sold to the Northrop Corporation. This ended forever the Halligans' involvement in Hallicrafters. Northrop moved the company to a new plant in Rolling Meadows, Illinois, and modified the logo again. While a subsidiary of Northrop, Hallicrafters produced ham radio products for a few more years, but the main function was producing paramilitary equipment in Northrop's Defense Systems Division, much of it in El Paso, Texas. For all practical purposes, the last ham radio item produced was the FPM 300 in 1972 and a few accessories through 1974. There were also some CB units and portable AM-FM shortwave sets of Japanese origin released under the Hallicrafters name. At this point, Northrop turned Hallicrafters over to its partner, Wilcox. The annual sales of Hallicrafters have been falling off sharply since 1970. On December 4, 1975, Wilcox sold the company to the Breaker Corporation of Dallas, Texas. Breaker packed up 14 semi-trailer loads of Hallicrafters records and parts and moved the company to Grand Prairie, Texas. They set up shop there with several former Hallicrafters employees of the late 60s and 70s who relocated to Texas. A few more CBs and various portable radios of Japanese and Taiwanese origin were released, but Breaker began to suffer severe financial difficulties. Around 1979, Breaker ceased doing business and Hallicrafters along with it. On August 24, 1979, Clarence E. Long engineered a purchase of the name, logos, and what was left of the company. A new corporation called Hallicrafters International was set up in Miami. It also had international trademarks. Long set up shop and hired a large staff in anticipation of receiving large government contracts to build paramilitary radios for the armed forces. The new Hallicrafters International had to prove to the government that it could handle the contracts as well as the old firm had. Something went wrong, however. Long's plans failed to be approved and Hallicrafters lost the contracts. In the early 1980s, Long set up a plant somewhere in the New England states and also had convinced several well-known people in other parts of the company to join in the new venture. Despite all this activity, Long was in serious financial and legal trouble. He declared bankruptcy on June 1, 1988 in San Antonio, Texas. All of his property, including the Hallicrafters name, logos, and whatever records were saved, were made property of a court-appointed trustee. Since this time, the Hallicrafters name has not been used and for all practical purposes is non-existent except in the memory of ham radio operators. In our next installment, we will continue looking at fallen flags in the amateur radio field. This is Bill Continelli, W2XOY, for this week in amateur radio. Time now for the AMSAT report. This week we have a bunch of rovers out there you might be interested in. July 15th through the 19th, look for Sean, KX9X, and Nancy, N9NZY, operating from the EN5767 grid line. Zorin, WA7AA, will be roving on July 10th in DN23, July 11th in DN25, July 12th in DN27, July 13th through the 16th in DN28, July 17th in DN38, July 18th on the DN4748 grid line, 
July 21st through the 23rd in DN54, July 25th through the 27th in DN64, and July 30th through the 31st in DN63. That's going to be a real busy rove, so we hope you get to work the grids you need. AMSAT has spent the last few weeks moving all of its data to a new server. Things have been tweaked, and some of the things that were broken have been fixed. Service should now be more stable, and thanks to the AMSAT IT staff for their diligence and time in handling this daunting task. The AMSAT report comes to us each week, courtesy of Bruce Page, KK5DO. It's time now for the weekly propagation forecast report. Tad Cook, K7RA in Seattle, Washington, reports that solar activity continues to increase. In last week's bulletin, we reported the average daily sunspot number was 34.7. This week, it jumped all the way to 55.6. The average daily solar flux increased from 86.9 to 88.9. Despite solar flare activity pushing a sudden ionospheric disturbance and a dramatic HF radio blackout on July 3rd, the average daily planetary A indice for the week was only 5.7, down from 6.1 last week. The average middle latitude A index was also just 6.1 last week, and it was 6.3 this week. The July 3rd X-Class flare was a 1.5 class event, the biggest since September 2017, and the only X-Class solar flare since then. It got a lot of amateurs wondering what was up. Scott Craig, for example, WA4TTK, wrote, What happened at about 1430 UTC on July 3rd? Some people on the forum are saying it was a massive solar flare. He was on 20 meters on FT8 when his waterfall display went from solid red signals to solid nothing in the blink of an eye. It lasted about 10 minutes. Events such as this can be so dramatic that many may assume a hardware or antenna failure. Fortunately, these are rare. WA3LPL developed an excellent narrative on this event. The first X-Class major solar flare of Solar Cycle 25 blacks out HF on July 3rd. The event received some coverage outside of the usual channels, including reports on market research telecast, IFL Science, and a big report on CNN. Also, Tamitha Skav, WX6SWW, our space weather woman, covered this in her July 6th edition of Space Weather News. So let's look ahead. The predicted solar flux is 73 on July 10th through the 13th, 72 on July 14th and 15th, 76 on July 16th, 82 on July 17th and 18th, 84 on July 19th, and 88 on July 20th through the 22nd. Looking at the predicted planetary A and dice now, it'll be 5 on July 10th, 8, 12, 16, 12, and 8 on July 11th through the 15th, respectively, 5 on July 16th and 17th, 15, 12, and 10 on July 18th through the 20th, and 5 on July 21st through the 31st. Tom, Oscar Hotel 6 Victor Delta Alpha, who also holds the call sign LA6VDA, will once again be active as Juliet Whiskey 6 Victor Delta Alpha from the Juliet Whiskey 5 Echo Club Station in Longyear Beam on Spitzenberg Island between October the 12th and November the 1st. Activity will be holiday style on various HF bands using single side band FT8 and FT4. You can QSL via Logbook of the World, EQSL, Club Logs OQRS or QRZ.com. Bureau cards should go via Lima Alpha 6, Victor Delta Alpha. And John Whiskey 5 Juliet Oscar November has announced that he will once again be active as Victor 47 Juliet Alpha from his Calypso Bay, St. Kitts, West Indies vacation home, located 200 feet from the Caribbean Sea, between October the 4th and the 18th. Activity will be on 160 to 6 metres using single sideband and FT8. His equipment is a Yesu FT1000 MP, an FT450 Delta, and an Ellicraft KPA500 amplifier. John's antennas are a Mosley Mini 32A for 10, 15 and 20 metres, a 33-foot vertical for 10 to 40 metres, a 35-foot top-loaded 80-metre vertical, a 160-metre vertical, and for 6 metres, a 5-element Yagi. All QSLs to go to Whiskey 5, Juliet Oscar November, direct or via Logbook of the World. He's not accepting Bureau QSLs.
John says that he'll also make a side trip to St. Eustatius Island, the prefix there, Papa Juliet 5, and St. Martin Island, prefix Foxtrot Sierra. And Jerry, Golf 3 Whiskey India Papa, has now received his call sign and will be active as Zulu Delta 7 Golf Bravo from the main village of Jamestown on St. Helena Island. He's there working as a doctor on the island until September the 6th, so activity will be during his spare time on 40 to 10 metres using single sideband FT8 and FT4. Jerry also has his QO100 satellite gear with him. His transceivers are an FT857 and an Atlas 210. Antennas are a vertical that tunes on 20 metres as well as a long wire. The QSL details are yet to be finalised. A new D expedition combines science, art, adventure and amateur radio as a Russian artist, writer and Russian Orthodox archpriest set sail to activate a polar station adrift in the Arctic Ocean. Imagine an ice flow more than three meters thick set up as a shack for the multi-purpose amateur radio D expedition. The Poseidon Expeditions team set sail on July 11th with Russian writer and artist Fedor Konyakov, R0FK on board. Fedor is making his fourth trip to the North Pole, where he will study ice melt patterns and drift routes and perform other scientific observations with the help of equipment from the Institute of Oceanology of the Russian Academy of Sciences and other organizations. Using 100 watts, Fedor will activate R0FK forward slash P-O-L-E on 20 meters and hopes to transmit on or around 14.333 megahertz. Details of his activation schedule can be obtained from the RA5G club station. In translation from Russian, the 69-year-old traveler writes on his website, The station will allow me not only to do science, but also I will paint pictures, keep a diary, and a lot more. The American Radio Relay League is planning a rededication of operations this July. ARRL board members from across the United States will join elected officials in reopening the world headquarters at 225 Main Street, Newington, Connecticut. We're really rededicating the work we do in Newington coming out of COVID, an organization that's weathered two pandemics, product development manager Bob Enderbitson explained. The ARRL has over 158,000 members, all of whom are essential amateur radio operators and hobbyists. There are over 2,000 members in Connecticut alone. During the COVID-19 pandemic, they checked in on each other from across the globe. In a world of Zoom meetings and lots of online streaming, it really offered an alternative for ham radio operators to communicate with one another, Interbitson said. We even saw a surge in new interest. In the midst of isolation, amateur radio became a window to the world for a lot of people. This past weekend was the ARRL's field day. Over 35,000 ham radio operators participated in what they refer to as amateur radio's largest demonstration. The rededication movement is a way for ARRL to move forward from the pandemic and celebrate its growing membership. It's also the beginning of a new hurricane season. When the ARRL formed in 1915, telephones were an expensive commodity and early ham radio technology allowed people to relay messages to others across the country. These days, hams, as they've come to be known, are essential in natural disasters and emergencies, when all other forms of communications have failed. Radio waves are transmitted over the Earth's ionosphere, allowing operators to communicate across continents. In the last 10 or 15 years, there have been a lot of important instances of trained amateur radio operators rising up to the challenge in their communities when they're called into emergency situations, Interbitson pointed out, particularly in the southeast and gulf regions of the United States, where hurricanes can wreak havoc on coastal cities. Members of the ARRL's Amateur Radio Emergency Service train all year long for these situations, keeping hospitals, police, and dispatch centers connected when other communication systems become damaged or disabled. ARRL currently employs nearly 100 people at its Newington headquarters. The organization also has a long-standing partnership with NASA on the International Space Station. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR. As we slog our way through Solar Cycle 25, is HF handband propagation improving? One positive indicator is the 10 meter FM repeater subband. I suspect some of you are wondering, 10 meter repeaters? Well, there are 10 repeater pairs spaced 10 kilohertz apart from 29.610 to 29.690 megahertz. The input for each pair is 100 kilohertz down. If you have ever seen a set of 2-meter duplexers, you can readily understand why your average 10-meter FM repeater is set up with separate transmit and receive sites. 
One such repeater is the KQ2H Catskills Mountains FM repeater on 29.620 MHz. Its trustee is Alex Musica, KQ2H, a resident of the hamlet of Kerhonkson, New York. Rains Hapali, KC9RP, spoke to Alex via Zoom in early June about Alex's 17 multi-site mountaintop repeaters, specifically his 29.620 MHz 10-meter FM repeater located in Upper New York State. Good evening. This is KQ2H 10-meter repeater. Tell me where the KQ2H 10-meter repeater is located. Wurtsboro, New York. That's the transmitter. The south receiver is about 60 miles southeast of Wurtsboro. North receiver would be northwest of Wurtsboro by about 50 miles or so. There's 17 repeaters. Not every one of them is 10 meters. Most of them are actually UHF, 440 megahertz band or 70 centimeters. There's no amateur equipment. Equipment that was originally used, not on 440 megahertz, but on 460 or so. And it was retuned and repurposed for a 440 megahertz. Your 900 mega equipment. Same thing, old Motorola radios that were reprogrammed into the handband. FM links, nothing special, nothing high tech. However, it is reliable and it works. And I've been using it for years and have no need to change anything. You have some real challenges on 10 meters that you don't have on VHF, UHF. 100 kilohertz separation between the input and the output. What are you using for your 10FM transmitter? The 10FM transmitter is a mixture of different parts. It's some GE radio, some Motorola, all cobbled together. What kind of power output is it? The transmitter is the legal limit, 1500. And is it located on a mountaintop as well? Yes, it is. And that's in the Catskill Mountains? Correct. What kind of power levels are you having to use for your remote receive sites to the transmitter? The radio links from mountaintop to mountaintop, these directional antennas for a very low power, five watts or less. Are they all on mountaintops? Yes, probably the lowest bound, maybe 2,000 feet elevation and the highest being 3,400, 3,500 feet elevation, pretty much in that range. So there were no commercial antennas available that could handle the wind loading and mother nature on top of a tower, on top of a mountain. The weather was brutal, so there were some mechanical problems and issues, so an antenna had to be made that would handle that. And the other problem was, even if there were antennas that were physically strong enough to handle the environment, they were not strong enough to handle nonstop, continuous, legal limit FM signal, a carrier present pretty much all day and throughout most of the night. And there are a lot of failures and parts melting and blowing up inside. So antenna had to be constructed that could handle that aspect of it as well. That solution came in basically a homebrew design. It's been probably a good 20 years that the homebrew antennas have been up, have not had a single issue or problem with them since. With over 2,663 minutes of BS, this is KQ2H repeater. Did you design both the receive and transmit antennas? Yes, I did. You have any kind of write-ups about those antennas? No, but there's a picture of me on my Facebook page that shows me standing next to one of the homebrew antennas. What makes them so much more weather durable than others that are on the market? Well, they're constructed with aluminum, much heavier, much thicker than most commercially made antennas are. And they probably weigh about 70 pounds, if not more. A pretty heavy antenna for what it is. The half-wave coaxial dipole, it's vertical. Nothing special about it other than the fact that it's heavy duty and there's a step transmission line inside the feed point so that it matches 50 ohms to 75, whatever the impedance is of a dipole. I think the antennas last time I swept them had a 1.0 3 to 1 SWR, so we're pretty happy with that. They're fed with a heavy hard line, Heliax. They're designed to handle power as well, besides being rugged. 
they are designed to be reliable. Obviously, all this equipment repurposed or otherwise costs a few bucks. Are those out of pocket or do you have some help from outside? Nobody helps. This is all old equipment that I acquired. Retired, basically, from what it was being used and repurposed for uh, 440 megahertz or 900. It's basically all junk parts. How is it that you wanted to tie in 17 repeaters into your 10FM repeater? So I could actually use it wherever I travel. I do a lot of driving all over the place and sometimes I travel as far as 200 miles or so. Naturally, I like to have a radio system that I can use on my travels and it attracts people in areas that are rural and normally would not have a repeater and they're very fortunate to have something or at least they tell me they can actually use from rural areas that normally but don't have repeaters or if they do it's some kind of a club and it's very restrictive and very limiting and no one to talk to and it's no fun anyways they find 10 meters sort of interesting breath of fresh air so to speak i hardly ever get in on this band here and i <laughs> And I've seen that six meters was going crazy, so I said, oh, well, ten's got to be going, doing something. So I said, well, what the hell, I might as well just roll up on the FM portion up here, see if repeaters are ka So I, I heard you in there, so I figured I better try it out. But I didn't have my radio set up right here, and I didn't know if there was a tone on this or not. This repeater does have a PL frequency of 146.2? Correct. And yet, a lot of the communications from 10 meters is non-PL. That's unfortunate because I have one receiver that doesn't require a PL tone to activate and people can try or get on and hopefully they would turn the PL tone on so they could get into the other sites. But most of them do not and they don't have the advantage of a voted system. So their signal is subject to fade. It doesn't vote into anything else, which is unfortunate. You're listening to a conversation with Alex Musica, KQ2H, trustee of the 29.620 10-meter FM mountaintop repeater located in the Catskill Mountains of Upper New York State. We'll resume Hapali KC9RP's conversation with Alex in a moment. It's 2021. There shouldn't be a radio out there that doesn't generate a PL tone. There's really no excuse to not have it. You go on eBay, there are commercial low-band radios that are being sold under $100 or so, and they all work extremely well. They're designed to operate FM. They have PLs. They have noise blankers. Pretty much from my experimentation, they put to shame every amateur-grade type radio for 10 meters FM. And yet people don't like to run PL for some reason. They'll they get on and operate without it. So that is probably the main reason why I have one receiver that way. By using a fully PL system, it would completely cut out three quarters of the users out there. For some reason, they will not run PL. You tell them they can't figure it out. They don't know how to use it. Some don't even know how to do the 100 kilohertz split on the output. Repeater has been there for 30 years. PL has never changed. But yet to this day, you have people that refuse to use PL. That's unfortunately the sad truth. There are those that complain, well, how come your repeater is not PL that causes interference, this, that, whatever. That's not my fault. If you have three quarters of the people don't want to use it, can't use it, or don't know how to use it, there really is no option other than cutting them out by engaging that, activating it at all the receiver sites. If I had all the receivers open to a carrier squelch operation, each one would then pick up some kind of a noise and there would be non-stop continuous keying up from, let's say, RF generators. The ones in the countries that have the 50 Hertz AC power You'll hear either a 100 hertz buzz or a 300 hertz buzz, depending if it's a single phase or three phase power supply. Then you have the RF generators that are in the 60 hertz country, the 120 or a 360 hertz buzz. And when their press head is doing its job, the RF generator activates and you hear the sound. That's all I'll get day and night when the band is open from the X. One receiver, I think, will keep enough people going if they're interested they'll turn the pl tone on and of course their signals greatly improve because as they fade from one receive location they fade into another and they will vote back and forth automatically so that actually does work very well now put pl tone on every receiver then 
what it would do is the guys that don't have PL tone still won't get it. They will not use it. And another repeater will then pop up on the same frequency somewhere else and it will be in carrier squelch and it'll be keyed up all day and all night with noise and that's what will happen there's a band opening there'll, there'll be some interference some noise but usually things work out and there are no issues it's really a no win situation for you with 10 meters no that's how it is it's either you'll have a gray repeater that's open a lot of people will use it as it's been the case last sunspot cycle there was about 90 days where we had f propagation from europe the middle east down to texas i mean there was non-stop activity from six o'clock in the morning till sometimes midnight somebody would be talking to someone across the country across the world it was very interesting to say the least hey alex is an extremely talented man and He's got a lot of time and money into uh, Cat just jumped on me and used his claws into this repeater system. I appreciate the use of his repeaters very much. The times I've worked into your machine, I've heard and have spoken to Ellen AA2EC for the interest of many who have spoken with her. How long has she been involved with the repeater? I would say at least a year. She's been active on there, maybe a little bit longer. She's not a relative of mine, but she's been on a year repeater long enough, and we speak to each other often enough. She communicates well. She seems to be there a lot, and that's great. That gives the repeater some personality and somebody to talk to. Yes, that's greatly appreciated. For some of us, including myself, I don't have the time to drop what I'm doing and get on and chase the DX station. She will, and she'll welcome them and be pleasant and basically invite them to come on again. It's a very nice thing that she does, trying to work with DX the way she does. If you don't have the PL tone, if you can put a PL tone in your radio, please go ahead and put in the 146.2, 146.2. I'm not sure if it's the band or the you not having the PL tone in there but you're not holding on to the repeater that well. So November 9, Bravo Alpha Foxtrot, Alpha Alpha 2 Echo Charlie in the beautiful Upper Hudson Valley of New York. And what do you do for your livelihood, sir? At the moment, I work in public safety communications to a radio. This is something that I've been doing for the past 10 years or so. Prior to this, I was the broadcast engineer for a TV station in the city. My home away from home was World Trade Center and the Empire State Building. 30 years ago, when you put your 10-meter repeater on the air, what right. motivated you to go that route? Well, that's very simple. 10 meters FM was always my favorite mode. Ever since I got my Comtronics FM80, the Comtronics FM80 was, you know, if I remember correctly, it was a little plastic, like a CB radio. It wasn't anything spectacular. QRP. By today's standard, piece of garbage, but it was the first radio I had. I remember a little analog S meter and tuning in stations on the calling frequency and then tuning in repeaters that were all over the place, mostly the Texas area. And there was another repeater later on, several years after I continued listening to the Virgin Islands. In any event, all of these sounded very interesting. It was a band that I enjoyed back then. I wanted to set up a repeater because if i set up a remote base let's say on the calling frequency i would be rebroadcasting and transmitting a lot of traffic that shouldn't really be there so i figured let me just start right off the bat and do it correctly and use a repeater pair rather than the calling frequency to play with the 10 meters fm you're not holding the repeater if you can hear me uh, and, and you can put a pl tone in the the program there please put 146.2 146.2 if you can't put a, a PL tone in there, I understand, but it's not going to make you great contact tonight. Alpha Alpha 2, Echo Charlie, monitoring KQ2H. You're listening to a conversation with Alex Musica, KQ2H, trustee of the 29.620 10-meter FM mountaintop repeater located in the Catskill Mountains of Upper New York State. We'll resume Hapali KC9RP's conversation with Alex in a moment. They're all connected through the voter. The strongest signal is selected by the voter, but in order for you to access all of them, you need to run PL tone because one out of three is carrier squelch. So when you're just running no PL, you're not voting. You just lose your ability to 
possibly get a better signal into the repeater by doing so. If you run PL, you get into all three of them. I also was involved in other little things that most of us would never consider or ever think would work. Portable radios, they work really well. I have a few Motorola, some Kenwood commercial low band 30 megahertz radios that I tuned down or reprogrammed to 10 meters, tuned the antennas correctly on a field strength meter, did whatever to get them to work correctly on 10 meters. Other people have done the same and would check in from Phoenix and South Florida with portables and using the rubber duck antennas. I've done the same. I worked repeaters in the Carolinas or so, short sporadic e-skip using the portable. There are portable operations. They have these big antennas, probably like loaded CB whips or little dipoles, little backpack radios, but never something small that you just fit in your pocket. I had a keynote pager that was on 33 megahertz. It was a fire pager has been modified to have a, a little squelch board in it. The pager is less than half a pack of cigarettes. It runs on a single AAA battery. Uh, it has a little tiny loop stick antenna. I modified them to work on 10 meters and receive well. And one of the things that would always fascinate me was visiting my brother-in-law down in Davies, Florida. In the morning, now just sitting in the living room, having coffee. And right on the coffee table, you know, right in the middle was that little pager. Lo and behold, the band opened up and I heard my repeater loud and clear on a little tiny device like that with a loop stick antenna. That's probably half an inch to three quarters of an inch long inside that unit. I can buy a Minotaur 2 pager, which is probably very inexpensive. You might be able to get one for $20 or less. And you could even set up a little, what they call the permacode filters in there. It's even receiving the repeater, I can encode a two-tone sequential AB tone and actually beep it, make it page. All that's available. The gotcha is that International Crystal Company, Bomar Crystal, Martin, Crystal, Crystal Tronics, their bread and butter business was making uh, small crystals for uh, crystal controlled pagers. They are all out of business. There's no crystal manufacturer left that I'm aware of in the United States. With that being said, you know, Motorola moved on to the Minotaur 6 series of pager. Those are all synthesized, computer programmable. I have one on two meters. That you could program up on a computer easily. No crystals required. But there are no manufacturers that really make a programmable low band pager. A lot of municipalities are going to 700 megahertz or UHF. All the 46 and 33 megahertz fire paging stuff is dying and it's gone. I have two pagers that I have on uh, 10 meters. One of them is a Minotaur 2. That's designed to be a pager. It has a squelch circuit, smaller than a pack of cigarettes, maybe like a half a pack or something. It's really tiny. And then there's one that's even smaller. It's called the Kino. It's about the height of a AAA battery, maybe two or three inches wide. It's very tiny. And the problem with them, they never had a squelch circuit. There was one company that made a tiny a squelch adapter for them. So they were talking this back in the 90s. You could modify that to, you know, be like a monitor receiver. But as P&W Communications, they're out of business too. So that little board is no longer made. This is the Indian computer lady, girlfriend of KB2CXJ. I welcome you to the KQ2H repeater, New York. The Minotaur 2 is one of those fire pagers that was originally on 3396, like in the 33 megahertz range. And it was pretty easy. There was not much to do to bring it down to 29.62. I think all I did was I just got a crystal and maybe at the pad, a capacitor, you know, so the antenna would tune a little better. But it wasn't that impossible or that big of a deal to do. I even have a Minotaur 2 that I brought down to two meters. And again, I had to change a few little chip capacitors so that it would tune correctly. That receiver and that is hot as a pistol, better than the crystal ones. But again, no crystals, they become a paperweight. Like I say, you're out of luck when it comes with pagers. Between crystals and obsolescence, they're not going to find one. A better solution would be not a pager, but something that's ever so slightly larger than a pager, and that's one of those Motorola portables. Those you can still get. They're not crystal controlled. They are programmable. What I do is I get an uncut low-band rubber ducky antenna. I'll sit there with a field strength meter, and I'll drop little pieces of ferrite in there because the antenna, with the, even uncut, they're tuned to around 
31 megahertz or so. They're tuned a little high, and the ferrite brings them right down to 29.6, 29.5 megahertz. I'll just drop some hot glue in there to keep the ferrite from falling out, put the antenna cap on. With a resonant antenna like that, a, a portable is probably better if you want to just put that on, let's say, your dining room table. And when the band is open, you'll hear the repeater or whatever come in something that you can carry with you it's handheld if you go out somewhere you'll actually use that that's probably your better bet unless i could find crystals for a minotaur or one of those receivers i don't think it's even possible another you had asked about why i enjoyed it the uh, repeater besides discovering strange things such as the uh, pl tone buzzing or the audio echoes i've heard other strange propagation i remember being down in ohio too far for a ground wave signal. And I always listen, I always have the radio on. And I would hear my friend, and his call was KB2KUU. I would hear an opening so brief where I would hear KB2KU, you, you know, there's like the second U is already cut out, it would drop. Or, or I would hear like, for example, a suffix of the call sign and the courtesy tone of the repeater, and then it would drop out. So there were multiple band openings that probably were caused by meteor scatter or some strange atmospheric conditions where you have a good, clear band opening. It just appears instantaneously, and as quickly as it appears, it goes away. I used to hear that quite a bit on 10 meters over the years, something that I found really fascinating about that band and FM propagation. It's fun. I like playing with it, although sometimes it gets to a point where it's excessive. My biggest gripe, go through the effort of making sure that all the audio levels across the system are balanced and sound the same and pretty much transparent where you go on. It takes a lot of effort. At least some of these guys spend a little time and effort to get a radio that sounds good rather than spending $25 on some Chinese piece of garbage. They don't know how to use it. The level is low or it's all muffled. <laughs> very mid-rangey, becomes muffled and compressed. To me, that's sort of a slap in the face. I spent a lot of effort and time to get the audio. So it, it may not be something that everyone understands or realizes or sees, but I mean, come on, guys. I spent a lot more than $25 trying to keep this thing working between electric bills and parts and this and that. You could at least do me a solid here and, and get a radio that sounds good. It doesn't sound narrow band or something stupid like that. This isn't amateur basket weaving. This isn't amateur video. This is radio. You're listening to a conversation with Alex Musica, KQ2H, trustee of the 29.620 megahertz 10 meter FM repeater in Wurtsboro, New York. Hap will conclude his chat with Alex after you identify your station. Greetings from the beautiful Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. This is KQ2H Repeater. If you really want to put things in perspective, the uh, amateur repeaters are co-located or part of a large EMR Connect Plus system that I take care of. And that has hundreds of repeaters, literally no exaggerations, throughout New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New England, and I maintain that as well. Radio is probably third or fourth on the list. It's not my primary hobby. It was back in the day when I was working on broadcast equipment, a big TV transmitter. They put out 33, 35 kilowatts. But there was enough of a difference between that and ham radio that it was more interesting, had more enthusiasm doing it. But now, if I have to deal with the two-way world with customers and police departments that are, you know, prima donnas and everything has to work and God forbid there's a little bit of noise in one little place and the people like that drive me nuts. You think the noise or ham radio is a problem, but, you know, you have certain customers that are a pain in the butt. After dealing with that, the last thing I want to do is play with radios when I get home. Was 29620 allocated to you and who does the allocation of 10 meter FM repeaters in New England today? Good question. I don't think anyone is actively doing much of anything as far as frequency coordination. Years ago, it used to be the 
Tri-State Amateur Repeater Council, TSARC. I don't believe they exist to this day, and if they do, they're certainly back in the heyday. For a while, I was actually the 10 and 6 meter frequency coordinator for them. There were several repeaters I've coordinated for 10 and 6 meters. Back then, it seemed like there's more interest in 6 meters than there was in 10. There are band openings, but yet no one talks on 10 meters, talks on 6 meters, unless the band is like really open for a long time then i guess news spreads but my finding is that there are times the band is open there's no, no one to talk to on 10 meters especially i noticed when there is a band opening say roughly 50 or 60 miles from the transmit location the pl tone will get very loud and it'll start buzzing that is caused by time domain interference between the direct ground wave signal from the transmitter to my mobile radio and signal that goes out let's say over the atlantic ocean reflects and comes back and it comes back at some strange time shift delay multipath phase and the first type of audio that gets distorted is pl tone then as it gets worse and worse then the speech will get distorted there are times i remember when this was so bad when we had the f skip openings i actually shut the pl encoder off because all I heard were loud buzzing within 10 miles or so of the uh, transmit location. Greetings from the beautiful Catskill Mountains of upstate New York. This is KQ2H Repeater. There are also times where I would be driving and I would hear, for example, your voice hap is very distinguishable. For example, you'd be talking in a repeater, but I would not understand what you're saying. It would be like, whoop, 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 whoop. You know, I, I know it's you, but I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> and then when I heard the CW ID, I realized what was, I heard echo. I would hear the courtesy tone twice. I would hear the like KQ2H would be no longer KQ2H. It would just be like a random bunch of dots and dashes, the original CWID, and then you'd hear the echo coming right after, and it would just indistinguishable. These conditions that I just described allow me to realize that there is a band opening on 10 meters, but there is no one on, no one's talking. There are a few users, they are a few that are diehards, and they will get on if they realize that the band is open, but it is open a whole lot more than we are led to believe. It's just not that much activity. And that is a valid issue. The band may be open, but unless you're actually hearing the beacons, 28.2 to 28.3, you never know if the band was open. I love your courtesy beep. It sounds like I'm on American Airlines and the pilot clicks on and tells the passengers, Ladies and gentlemen, I will turn off the fastened seatbelt sign. You're free to wander about the cabin. It's that two-tone chime. How is it that you acquired that for your repeater? Unfortunately, I cannot take any credit for that. That was the courtesy tone as well as I can remember because I have asked many people past 15, 20 years if anyone has a recording of the Virgin Islands repeater. 2966 when it was on the air that was the courtesy tone or the chime they used from my memory i try to reconstruct it with my controller that was the inspiration was them and if anyone listening to this podcast happens to have a recording of a qso on that machine i would love to hear it because i would like to recreate that courtesy tone exactly that was the inspiration that was the reason why i have it and it's sort of as a courtesy in memory of a repeater that that was probably one of the best 10 meter repeaters that i enjoyed and used and worked very well and, and unfortunately is no longer on the air if anyone wants to contact you who should they write just email me kq2h at yahoo.com kq2h at yahoo.com i always get some kind of correspondence whenever the band opens those emails start coming in do you send out qsl cards oh no i don't have qsl cards i haven't done that ever since i was a kid greetings from the beautiful catskill mountains of upstate new york this is kq2h repeater this concludes our time with alex musica kq2h longtime trustee of his catskill mountain 10 meter fm repeater which transmits on 29.620 megahertz from Wurtsboro, New York. So what does Alex do when he's not maintaining multiple repeaters around New England? 
restoring old kerosene lamps and cooking stoves. If you access Alex's 10 meter box, tell him Hap sent you, and don't forget to turn your 146.2 Hz PL tone on when you do so. I'm Will Rogers, K5WLR, bidding you very 73 from the Radio Amateur Information Network. The Slovenian Amateur Radio Union are celebrating the country's 30 years of independence by issuing a special award. All amateur radio enthusiasts over the world are eligible for the award. The event started at the end of June and is running until December the 31st, 2021. During this time, Slovenian amateur radio stations can use special call signs, adding the number 3030 into the suffix. For example, Sierra 50 Zulu Zulu will become Sierra 5030 Zulu Zulu. In order to obtain the award, a non-Slovenian amateur radio station must have at least 30 contacts with Sierra 5 stations, with both regular and special call signs applying. Ten or more must have been using the special 30 prefix. The use of any band and mode counts for the award. Send your final log to SCC, that's Sierra Charlie Charlie, at hamradio.si. The same email can also be used for inquiries about the award. The award will be issued in electronic form and will be downloadable as a PDF file from the website of Slovenia Contest Club. Foundations of Amateur Radio The hobby of amateur radio is about communication. When you go on air and make noise, you initiate a communications channel, sending information out into the world and hoping for another station to receive and decode what you sent. The channel itself can be used in an infinite number of ways, and each one is called a modulation mode, or mode for short. The popular ones come with most radios, CW, AM, SSB and FM. Those few are not the only ones available. In fact, as computers are being integrated into the radio at an increasing pace, signal processing is becoming part and parcel of the definition of a mode, and new modes are being introduced at breakneck speed. I've talked about Whisper as an example of one such mode, but there are many, each with their own particular take on how to get information between two stations. As you listen on the bands, you'll increasingly find yourself hearing a bewildering litany of beeps, pops and clicks. Some of those are due to ionospheric conditions, but many are different modes that are being experimented with across our spectrum. If you have access to a band scope, a way of visualizing radio spectrum, you can actually see the shapes and patterns of such signals over time, and getting to that point can be as easy as feeding your radio audio into your computer and launching a copy of FL Digi or WSJTX. Every mode requires a specific tool to decode it, and with practice you'll discover that there is often a particular look or sound associated with a mode. Over time you'll confidently select the correct decoder, using your brain for the process of signal identification. Of course, if you don't have access to the library in your brain yet, since you've only just started, or if the mode you've come across is new, you'll need another library to discover what you found. There is such a library, the Signal Identification Wiki. It's a website that hosts a list of submitted signals grouped by usage type, including one for our community. On the Amateur Radio page of the Signal Identification Wiki, there are over 70 different modes listed, complete with a description, an audio file, and a spectrogram. With that, you can begin to match what you've discovered on your radio to what the website has in the library, and determine if you can decode the incoming information. I will mention at this point that the Signal Identification Wiki is far from complete. For example, the Olivia mode has 40 so-called sub-modes, of which about 8 are in common use. Each of those sub-modes looks and sounds different. The wiki shows only a single line for Olivia. I'm pointing this out because the wiki allows you to submit a mode for others to use. If you have a signal, either by recording it off-air, or better still, recording it directly from the source, consider submitting it to the wiki so others can benefit from your experience. If you've come across a signal and you cannot figure out what it is, there are other places you can go for help. The 4,500 members of the Signal Identification Sub on Reddit will happily look at and listen to your signal and try to help. Make sure you contribute some metadata, like the time, frequency and location, to accompany the spectrogram and audio. 
You might have come to this point wondering why I'm encouraging you to use and contribute to the wiki and ask for help on Reddit. Amateur Radio is about experimentation. We love to do that, and as we make signal processing easier and easier, more people are making new modes to play with. The speed at which this is happening is increasing, and as an operator you can expect to come across new signals. I remember not that long ago, it was last month, tuning to an FT8 frequency and the person I was with asking what that sound was. They'd heard it before but never discovered its purpose even though FT8 has been with us since the 29th of June 2017. What interesting signals have you come across, and how did you go with decoding them? I'm Ono, Victor Kilo 6, Foxtrot Lima, Alpha Bravo. News in from the Irish Radio Transmitters Society in ERA, that last month, South Dublin Radio Club participated in the Dublin Maker STEM Promotion Festival, sponsored by Science Foundation Ireland. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering and Mathematics. Dublin Maker is a free-to-attend, community-run event. It takes the form of a show-and-tell experience, where inventors and makers have an opportunity to demonstrate their creations in a carnival atmosphere. It's a family-friendly showcase of invention, creativity and resourcefulness, and a celebration of the maker movement. It's a place where people show what they're making and share what they're learning. Makers range from technical enthusiasts to crafters, educators, tinkerers, hobbyists, engineers, artists, science clubs, students, authors and commercial exhibitors. They're of all ages and backgrounds, coming from all over Ireland and beyond. The Dublin Maker website says that their mission is to entertain, inform and connect the makers of Ireland, while inspiring the next generation of Ireland's makers and inventors. Due to the ongoing pandemic, the festival was held online. If you missed the live event, video content produced for the festival is now available to view on South Dublin Radio Club's YouTube channel and includes some interesting presentations. For example, there's Neve Learns Morse Code with South Dublin Radio Club. In this video, Keith Echo India 5 Kilo Oscar gives Dr Neve Shaw, one of Ireland's foremost science communicators and a STEM specialist, a light-hearted introduction to Morse code. This video is a great educational resource for anyone wishing to learn more about Morse code. Another presentation is entitled Make Your Own Radio Receiver. In this video, Kevin Echo India 3 Echo Uniform demonstrates how to make a radio receiver from mostly household items. This is a great STEM starter project and can be used to learn the basics of radio communication technology. It's an ideal project for teachers, students and those starting out in amateur radio and hobby electronics. You can also watch a video which is a live stream recording of South Dublin Radio Club's Sunday morning 40 metre net. This video gives good insight for beginners in the practicalities of radio operation and running a radio net. An on-screen SDR waterfall is used to explain the basics of the radio spectrum and other aspects of amateur radio. Again, this video is a great resource for those wishing to learn more about amateur radio. South Dublin Radio Club says they'd like to take this opportunity to thank club members for their efforts over the two-day event and to thank all the crew at Dublin Maker for their tireless work in making the event possible. And now, with his segment on how to successfully compose a public service announcement to promote your radio club meeting or ham fest on local broadcast radio, here is Arizona's own Greg Stoddard, KF9MP. In this sixth segment on the topic of promoting your not-for-profit ham radio club's events, we'll look into some hints and suggestions for getting your public service announcement on the air for free. In the broadcast industry, a common business practice is what they call trade. Radio stations trade ads for services. They trade airtime for products and services. Some stations trade advertising airtime for perks like free meals for station employees at local restaurants, free gas at gas stations for ads, office equipment and computers for ads, and more. You can use this to your advantage, too. When you are able to create the ultimate PSA script, the next thing to accomplish is to get it recorded professionally, and here's where the trade comes in. First off, it is not advisable to get a present or recently passed local DJ or announcer to record your PSA, since other radio stations are not likely to broadcast a competitor's voice. 
unless you have a club member with professional sound gear at home who can produce it, record it, and produce CDs or reel-to-reel -reel tapes for your club, your next best bet is to research trade. Many radio stations buy or trade for professional voice services. They email or fax scripts and get tapes or CDs in the mail a week or so later. You may be able to get your local station to have this done along with theirs at no cost since they typically pay a monthly fee which does not change with usage. Some stations have local folks they hire and pay like 20 bucks to come in and voice some commercials once a month or so. These folks may be willing to do yours, too, at no extra cost. All this will require some sort of relationship with a local radio station, which can start with something as simple as inviting them to your next club meeting, personally tutoring them or a family member through your technician test classes and VE session, or a few free tickets to your next HamFest. You could also offer to trade HamFest table space for a professionally recorded PSA for your next HamFest. Anyway, trade is something common in the broadcast industry, so use it to help promote your club. This is Greg Stoddard, KF9MP, reporting for This Week in Amateur Radio. Here's the updated listing of ARRL Learning Network webinars. To register, check on upcoming webinars, and view previously recorded sessions, please log on to the ARRL Learning Network webinar webpage. Learning with High Altitude Balloons, hosted by Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN, will be held on Thursday, July 22nd, 2021, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. That's 1930 UTC. Jack McElroy, KM4ZIA, and Audrey McElroy, KM4BUN, talk about their experiences with high altitude balloons, explain how others can get involved in high altitude balloons, and discuss launching it successfully. Their discussion will include how high altitude balloons are a great way to involve more youth in ham radio and how they can be a fantastic learning experience for students. ARRL members may register for upcoming presentations and view previously recorded learning network webinars. ARRL affiliated radio clubs may also use the recordings as presentations for club meetings, mentoring new and current hams, and discussing amateur radio topics. The ARRL Learning Network schedule is subject to change and is a member's only benefit. Imagine having more than 70 years worth of amateur radio magazines at your fingertips while still having plenty of room on your bookshelves. Spain's National Amateur Radio Society, the URE, has just made that possibility for their amateurs. The organization has digitized issues from 1949 to 2020 and created PDFs that are downloadable from their website. Each PDF of the Spanish magazine is approximately 200 megabytes. The files are readily available if you live in Spain or simply interested in their amateur radio history. URE website says that by making the archives available in this way, it's hoped that its history will gain greater visibility. The next step is to create an index and a search system to locate the various articles. And finally this week, is the planet Pluto still in your orbit? Did you participate in the special event in February that launched the 10-year countdown to the 100th anniversary of Pluto's discovery? Or did you mean to and just never got around to it? According to Bob Wirtz, NF7E, one of the organizers, the event was such a success that not everyone got to work W7P this year, so the special event is getting back on the air for three more days. On Friday, August 6th through Sunday, August 8th, the Northern Arizona DX Association is putting W7P back on the air to mark the anniversary of Pluto's discovery by Clyde Tombaugh at the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona. Just as in February, you will also have a chance to work with the late astronomer's nephew, Doug Tombaugh, who will be using the call sign W7P forward slash zero. After that, be listening each year on the Saturday preceding February 18th. The special event will conclude in 2030, which marks 100 years since the discovery. For details about QSL cards and certificates, visit the association website at nadxa.com. Many of the news and information items heard on This Week in Amateur Radio have been provided by the American Radio Relay League, the ARRL Letter, the ARRL Audio News, 
the Southgate Amateur Radio News Service, Southgate Vibes, AMSAT, the Radio Amateurs of Canada, the FCC, the Radio Society of Great Britain and Ofcom, the SARL, the International Amateur Radio Union, the Wireless Institute of Australia, the Amateur Radio Newsline, the International Telecommunications Union, and various news sources on the Internet. This Week in Amateur Radio is heard around the world on amateur radio repeater systems, streaming on the Internet, or on great low-power FM broadcast stations like WGXC-FM, part of the Wave Farm on 90.7 MHz in Accra, New York, serving Greene County and the southern regions of New York's Capital District. This Week in Amateur Radio is produced by Community Video Associates Incorporated. Now for the staff of This Week in Amateur Radio, this is Jeff Rahner, WB2AEQ, saying 73 until next week. This Week in Amateur Radio is copyright Community Video Associates Incorporated. All rights reserved.